right, we're gonna start soon. We've got a few uh, attendees that I know. Larry, I see a Dominic Heaton Watson. I think that's your friend, Marcus. Oh, okay. Is he? Uh, I know him, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. And um, we've got a few viewers on YouTube as well. So it's 10 o'clock, we'll start right away. Okay, everyone, welcome back. Welcome back to the Tuesday Talk Live by Place Borneo. Um, for those of you who has just joined us, welcome. And uh, my name is Mona Abdul Manap. I'll be your host for today. And for those who have stayed with us since MCO, we started in MCO. And um, thank you for staying with us. Welcome back. Um, those of you on Zoom, uh, you can ask your questions on the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. And th those of you on YouTube, you can also ask your question and um, they will be on the, just type your question on the chat box and we'll be able to pick it up. I think um, Gracie just left. Uh, she disappeared. Um, okay, I think she'll be back on soon. Uh, anyway, uh, Tuesday Talk Live is a platform for us to share ideas, information, solutions, um, just an exchange of information and ideas and knowledge, especially in these difficult times. Um, a lot of us don't know where to start or where we are, and um, it would be great for us to share uh, where we are right now, how do we go about surviving this pandemic. And this particular episode we have uh, it's called Recovery Branding for Tourism. Um, now, the fundamentals of branding are pretty much the same for all industries. And um, this is something that we, we're going to discuss today. And these are things that you can apply to your industry if you're not in tourism. Um, but the difference may be in the execution part of it. And today we'll touch a bit more on the execution. We may have a lot of strategies. We have fantastic action plans, task force, and all these um, you know, committee being set up, but maybe the execution part is the weak part for us. So that's something that we're gonna to touch on today. Now, even though the fundamentals are the same, but tourism right now is in a very difficult position because we are the most badly hit uh, by this pandemic and this financial crisis. So that's why we are focusing on the recovery branding for tourism. Now that's something different that we need to do. We cannot do branding how we did before. And today we've got very experienced speakers. We've got a branding expert and a tourism expert. Um, before that, I just need to check if Gracie's all right. <laughs> P, can you check for me and see if she's, she's just dropped off the screen? Yeah, yeah, we're checking. Okay. Okay, we'll wait a few minutes because I need to introduce her. And I um, need to see her face when I'm introducing her. <clears throat> okay. So, Marcus, have you got your coffee ready? Yeah, I have my coffee and I'm ready to go when we just need to find Gracie. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't know why she just suddenly dropped off. It could be her line. Oh, I think I see her now. Okay, she's back on. There we go. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to introduce the speakers. Um, first off is uh, Marcus, Mr. Marcus Osborne, the co founder and CEO of Fusion Brand which is headquartered in Kuala Lumpur. They are a brand consultant or brand consulting agency. And um, he is also a member of the National Tourism Task Force. So he's got experience in branding, he's an expert, and he's also experienced in tourism. So that's a really good mix for today's topic. He is also the author of the book, Stop Advertising and Start Branding. I like the title already. And Marcus, you need to tell us a bit more about your book and where we can get this book. Now, the next one, this is very interesting. He developed a brand strategy during the last financial crisis for Tourism Malaysia. And the result was they saved 15 million ringgit Malaysia 
and the increased arrivals. Now, how did you do that, Marcus? And that's what something maybe we need to pick on today um, during our discussions later on. That's very interesting. So welcome on the show, Marcus. Thank Next you. speaker, we've got our very own Bracey Jiki, Director and Principal Consultant of Place Borneo, Sudran Berhad. Uh, she's, uh, she's a well-known figure in the tourism industry in Sarawak, in Borneo, I would say, and she spent, well, literally her whole life in tourism. She started off uh, in the airline, in hotel operations and pre-opening. Um, he, she, she ran, she owned a travel agency, a travel operator. Uh, she was also in FNB. She owned a few restaurants and cafes, and now she's a conference manager. So um, she's, she's covered all the parts in tourism that you need to cover. So welcome. Uh, oh, yeah, I missed one very important point. She was the uh, CEO of the Sarat Tourism Board. So she'll be sharing with us her insights when she was with the board, what she did, and right now what uh, she thinks of um, how we should do recovery branding for Sarawak. So welcome to the show, Gracie. And um, as usual, we'll start off with a few minutes of individual introduction by uh, our speakers, and then we'll head right on to the discussion. So if you have questions, you can just put them in right now, and we'll pick it up along the way as we go along. So Marcus, we'll start with you. Okay, uh, thanks for that, Mona. Uh, and thanks for having me here. It's uh, great to uh, participate in this uh, conversation, and I'm looking forward to learning from it. Uh, so, on, uh, on the personal front, uh, I'm, my name is Marcus Osborne. I've lived in Malaysia since 1994. I'm uh, married to a Malaysian, a Sarawakian, uh, for my sins. And uh, I have three kids who were all born in Kuching. And they're very proud of the fact that uh, they come from Kuching and very proud of their Kuching heritage. Um, on a professional front, I co-founded Fusion Brand in 2003 after a career in sales and marketing in Europe, uh, the Middle East, and Southeast Asia. And we founded um, Fusion Brand because we saw how you know the, the branding landscape in Malaysia was changing, and the branding was becoming increasingly important. But we felt that a lot of Malaysian businesses were stuck in a uh, in a sort of trading mentality, which was being driven by the fact that uh, Malaysia had had sort of almost 20 years of dub double digit growth. Um, it was a very dynamic market. Demand was outstripping supply in every sector. Um, but we kind of felt that things were slowing down and it was getting a little bit, you know, as the, as the world got smaller and more flatter and more competitive and the Malaysian middle class was growing, uh, we saw that uh, a lot of international brands were going to start taking notice of Malaysia and start looking to sell their products in Malaysia, especially as their own markets were stagnating. And of course, things like AFTA meant that um, duties and taxes between countries uh, were reduced. So it was a lot easier for uh, brands to establish, international brands to establish themselves in say Thailand with a market of 70 million and then export products into Malaysia. And we see it now in the shops. Uh, there's an awful lot of international brands in, in sectors where really we probably should have uh, a lot more Malaysian brands. Um, so we wanted to establish a, a consultancy that would help those organizations focus more on value and move away from the trading mentality. And that's uh, how Fusion Brand grew. And we've been here now close to 20 years, uh, operating for close to 20 years. And we are fighting our way out of the post-COVID environment or the COVID environment. When we talk about branding, and especially in, in, in destination branding, we focus on two critical areas. One is the brand, and the second one is branding. And it's really important, I think, that we, we separate these two because there's a lot of confusion about whether what is brand, what is a brand, what is branding. So we, 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 we separate those two, and the definition for a brand, and especially a destination brand, is it's the visual, historical, 
environmental, cultural, even topographic aspects of the destination. And it's really important that when we develop our brand, you know, we base it on what the destination has, what the de destination has to offer, the reality of that, rather than what we want it to be. Mm -hmm. So authenticity is really important. And the way we do that is to leverage the, the, the natural assets into something of interest to the key segments that we want to target. And this is what formulates the destination's DNA, the brand DNA. And it must have at its heart a consistent goal of deliver, delivering um, memorable experiences to consumers at every touch point in their journey to visiting a destination. So that, that starts at the beginning where they're researching a destination, where they're looking at uh, online video, film, um, you know, images, content, and so on. Throughout the whole of the process, right up until when a destination becomes part of the consideration set, uh, it, it and and not and past that as well through through the actual experience of visiting the, the the destination, and then afterwards as well because technology allows us to have an ongoing relationship with those visitors. In terms of branding, it's how we bring the brand to life. So throughout that customer journey, we are we're involved um, with the with the with the consumer. And they're able to access us in a number of different ways through social media, through even direct communication with uh, the digital team that represents a, a tourism brand. Um, and if we're, if we're smart, if we work smart and we involve with, with the environment, we can use that technology to, to really uh, drive relationships between us, and the uh, between us and the potential visitor. And that's really important because um, most visitors, you know, if you look at the sort of primary markets for a destination like Sarawak or even Malaysia on a federal level, they're very competitive. There's a lot of competition out there. You, and using traditional media, traditional marketing, it's going to be very hard to connect with them because we simply don't have the budgets of, say, a Turkey or a Spain or a Portugal or, or whatever. So, um, you know, it's really important that the destination branding uses the opportunities to connect directly with the consumer. And when we're, when we're working on a brand strategy, I hate to say it, but we also need a little bit of luck. Um, most successful brand strategies, successful destination brands have a lot of luck involved in their success. A classic example, you know, the first great tourism brand, if you like, or destination brand that was marketed was Australia back in the 70s uh, when mass tourism was, was just beginning. And uh, they developed the shrimp on the Barbie campaign with, um, with an actor, I can't remember his name now, but, but he was very successful. He made the Crocodile Dundee movies. And a lot of the success to that is down, uh, credit, credited to that campaign. But in fact, it wasn't just that campaign, it was a number of areas that, that contributed to it. So Olivia Newton-John was uh, you know, in the first Grease movie with John Travolta, putting Australia on the map. Um, Men at Work released a song about um, living down under. Uh, mass tourism was taking off. You know, we have to remember that up until about 1978, uh, British travelers could only take 50 pounds with them overseas. So you know, the concept of mass tourism hadn't begun. So we need a lot of, we need a lot of luck as well in any brand strategy, destination brand strategy. Um, but the benefits are significant. You know, you, you're looking at lower acquisition costs, better reputation, improved visitor numbers, uh, increased investment in the, in the country or in the state, uh, lower marketing costs and so on. And if we don't do it, of course, you know, we, we face the risk of being left behind. Uh, or at best being left behind or at worst playing catch up on a constant basis because we're looking at what the competition is doing and trying to copy that. Um, so that's a brief introduction on me. Hope it wasn't too long um, and our approach to branding and brand. 
All right, thank you, Marcus. Um, you mentioned a lot of things that we could unpack um, in our next uh, few minutes of discussion, but I like the part where we are actually branding what we have to offer and what we're not creating something that we want it to be. So we need to know what, um, what we're good at, our products. We need to know ourselves first and then we can do branding. Now, I like that part. Um, okay, we'll go on to Gracie. Go on, Gracie. Hi everyone. Hi, um, my name is Gracie and uh, uh, I've been in tourism uh, since I left school. So I've, I've very much been in this line of tourism progressing from uh, hospitality to tour operating uh, DMC and now a professional conference organizer. I also train. I certify events uh, students uh, and, and I was very much involved in academic work. So my field of work is very much tourism. Uh, I can coin it in, in many other ways, but it still pushes back to tourism. Uh, I, like, I like what Marcus has mentioned about the, the, the strength of a brand. And, and uh, I'd really like to, to hear more than I think that's something that we here in Sarawak uh, need to think about uh not that we're not but to think about more seriously because i th I, I think we we have our assets and looking at our strengths and what we have i i feel for sarawak it's it's a very normal thing for people out there to say oh but we have nothing much to offer somebody else in the next state or, or country is is better they have better this and better that I think that's normal when we as our own people here look at that. And then when you have visitors and overseas uh, friends who come in, they look at things that we don't see or we take for granted. So I'm, I'm, I'm really glad that uh, uh, in, in the case of tourism here, our, our state government is, is uh, taking a very, very much uh, proactive approach in addressing a lot of issues and and just like every other destination we we have our issues you either have a, a good connectivity uh, uh, or lousy products or you you can have very great products not so great connectivity not enough infrastructure so all these things uh, sort of uh, when they come together as a whole and total sum will 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 allow us to see some some form of a, a, a position for for the destination so i i i feel that uh for sarawak and and for many of us our roles in in whichever form being the operator being the 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 educator and being the policy makers that we all have a role to play in tourism and i think now especially with the with the current situation that we are in uh the new norm and the new perspectives is something i want to talk about that we've got to have a hard look mm -hmm. a reality check on what's going to happen because it's not going to be the same like before your business is not going to be the same like before if you did two million you're not going to get back there and we got to talk about how do we how do we work around or work on this so that we don't get impacted or take for granted that we will be back to normal so um i i also uh, am very appreciative uh, of of the work done by brand specialist uh, marcus and you remember you introduced me to bill baker and 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 it was new for me and i keep reading about it and it's a lot of and even me i make the mistake of not understanding it well enough and um, maybe now is the time maybe this this post covid is bringing us to understand you know and with technology we we are driven to do this faster to move faster and hopefully uh, we have people out there listening and understanding what we need to do for Sarawak and for for Malaysia. So uh, I, I I will leave some of uh, some of my notes for later in case I run out of things to say. Uh, that's it from me now, and uh, I'll speak more later. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, uh, Gracie. And um, right, we've got a lot of things that we could actually talk about based just based on the few minutes that you guys uh, spoke earlier. 
And um, before we start, I'd just like to get a fresh perspective of what you think is the current situation or how you see the current situation for our tourism industry. Marcus, maybe you can start on this one from a branding point of view, from your own personal point of view. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, I, you know, the state the obvious first, the industry has been hit really hard. Um, just hospitality alone in the first three months of this year, even before COVID had actually, you know, sort of taken on the whole world, uh, there are 170,000 hotel bookings cancelled in Malaysia. And it's reckoned that in the first six months of this year, um, the industry has lost three and a half billion ringgit. Um, that's you know, lit, you know, literally un, unsustainable, uh, and the industry um, is suffering as a result. We're seeing lots of jobs lost. We're seeing hotels closed down, um, uh, and you know it's it's grim. Let's be frank, it's grim. But uh, you only need to look at the social media pages of of the minister and, and see how hard she is working to stimulate domestic tourism. And it's working. There's been a, a fair amount of you know, revenge tourism since the uh, lifting of the MCO. And, uh, you know, the, a lot of people are traveling. A lot of people are using the opportunity to, to, to get out and about. And it's benefiting domestic tourism. The problem is, of course, that a lot of the hotels that are benefiting weren't expecting it and they weren't prepared for it. And there's a lot of negativity around experiences that uh, people are not happy um, with the experiences they get when they go to uh, these individual destinations. That's something that the brands need to adapt to quickly. Uh, and uh, hopefully that's happening. Um, we'll see. The second thing is that I think that, you know, while that was in, that, that's great, that revenge tourism, and it's good to see what the minister's doing. I think that, you know, the, the tough part is gonna be at the end of September when all the, the government, um, government handouts finish when businesses are not getting uh, support from the government, then we're going to see how uh, the real land, lie of the land is going to be. Um, what I like about from the state perspective uh, with STB is that they're trying to stimulate domestic demand with the CSITOP program, which is, which is interesting. Uh, I don't know how it's working, uh, but it's, I think it's, Good to see that they've reacted really quickly on that, uh, and, I, and they're trying hard to get you know visitors from Semenanjung to go over there. That will be interesting to see how that works because I think this is a fantastic opportunity for uh, West Malaysians, most of whom that I meet have never been to Sarawak. Uh, so you know it's a great opportunity for for them to experience you know which, which is all what's almost like another country, but obviously is the same country. So I really hope that, that, that they'll ramp up that domestic marketing uh, and that the, the content that they're creating and, and ramp that up. And, uh, you know, we'll see Malaysians from over here buy into that. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's my, my key points that I can see at the moment. All right, thanks, Marcus. Um, I like that revenge tourism. I think um, this early demand that we expect, uh, at least maybe early next year, um, or even now we're seeing a lot of early demand or revenge tourism, as you call it, um, from domestic travelers. And later on, this early demand is going to be international travelers. So what are we doing right now to make sure that we capture as much as we can of this early demand? Um, Gracie, what do you think of the current situation of tourism? Um... Um, I, I, I agree, you know, what Mark is saying that what we're doing is the first thing, of course, you, you charity begins at home, right? You know, like you, you talk about domestic tourism and, and everyone's fast, uh, to, to act on this. And I think that that real urgent, uh, need, uh, to, 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 to revamp, not that we didn't have domestic tourism, but I think also our domestic tourism is probably anchored to the survival of, of the current, you know, uh, uh, tourism industry now. Having said that, uh, domestic tourism uh, sort of declined, if, if, if you'll agree with me, Marcus, when we had the advent of uh, local 
low low cost airlines or you know airlines flying really one ringgit fares to to other countries and i think that sort of uh, distracted all, all all everyone but now now that uh, no one can go anywhere okay. uh, we 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 have this need and i'm really really happy to see that uh, I myself, you know, revisited uh, Lundu uh, two weekends ago, and then you know you start seeing things and say, hey, you know, this was good, and and the the encouragement of all of us, and uh, I, I also saw last, uh, I think it was last week, the, our minister here in the South Tourism Board launched uh, a domestic campaign kind of program. Uh, it's called Siasito. Siasito in, in Sarawak means there and here. So, you know, go, going here and there. So I think the initiatives have started. I, I, I feel that we need to do, uh, it's great, but I think you got to keep pushing, you know, because eventually when the international markets pick up, we might lose some of them again. So let's, let's, let's work on, on, on this. And it has to be also interstate. And I think that's happening uh, uh, a fair bit. And eventually, when 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 the states re relax their 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 corridors of traveling and and you know all the, all the the various uh, uh, requirements that are needed, we'll we'll get to see a lot of our own Malaysian travelers visiting each other. This is probably the best time because everything's going for a very good deal. Uh, packages, incentives, and and Tourism Malaysia as a whole for promoting the destination is prepping uh, Malaysia to be ready for the international market. So likewise, Sarawak, I think we're, we're in there and, and the, the minister has, has, has had dialogue sessions with us. You know, it's not all a doom. I know, I know my first reaction was Gosh, you know, I mean, it was really negative, and it was oh, we we all going to die, you mm -hmm. know, and all that. But slowly, you start doing all the the hard checks and truths, and we speak with our industry partners, and we've we've had uh, endless uh, engagement sessions with the Ministry of Tourism, Arts and Culture, with the Tourism Board, with with the Convention Bureaus, and with industry partners. There is a way out of it. We realize that it is there. It's just a matter of, of us maneuvering. So I'm positive. I'll use the word. I'm positive that our recovery is, is going to come back, but not at the same pace or volume. So now if innovation comes in, strategic thinking and planning, you know, small is sweet suddenly, you know, before. Mm. It was mass, it was big numbers. We always go by the numbers, you know, uh, uh, how many people, you know, everybody's going by numbers. And the, the, But now small is sweet, small is beautiful. It's going to come back and the yield will be better. You know, the yield will be better. And, and I think uh, uh, currently from, from the tourism perspective, uh, uh, many of our tour industry partners, including the stakeholders, are... Uh, uh, are going into very creative, if I may say. They're going into a lot of other optional work or businesses, like offering offering to do a lot of services, like bank operators. You know, I had my online order delivered to me by by a freelance guide. I knew, you know, and I was so happy because I say, hey, you're doing something. Yes, yeah, says, you know, I'm doing this. Wait till everything comes back, then uh, I'll be guiding your clients again. You know, so it's very positive. Uh, uh, there, there are some negative aspects, maybe uh, just as in everything else, you know. But I think uh, we're getting there. Very fortunate, very fortunate that uh, uh, our ministry gets bombarded by people like me, you know, and and we we're, we're saying hey, why are we not doing this and all that. But they're listening, they're engaging, and I think it's all all for the good of of Sarawak for the state. Yeah. Thanks, Gracie. And I hope that we don't go back to our old ways of doing things. And I think the new norm, you know, small is the new big, um, not going into mass tourism and focusing more into ecotourism. I think that's the way to go, at least for Sarawak. Um, and um, well, before this, I saw that they were gearing towards mass tourism, and I thought that would not be good for Sarawak. That's not what um, we can offer. And I think it's just going to destroy us. Uh, and, and then it's going to destroy the product that we have, and then we would have nothing to, 
to market anymore. Um, well, that's the long term. Um, now, I think this one would be for Marcus. Um, what are the prevalent branding practices that you've seen um, people doing during the pandemic, uh, either in tourism or in other industries? Uh, and what do you think of them? Um, how have people been doing the branding so far? Uh, okay, can I just uh, react to that comment on uh, on the mass tourism? Yeah. And this is something that uh, Malaysia has and Sarawak has long focused on volume over you know over everything else. Let's mm -hmm. get mass tourism, but the product, the destination, is not geared up to that. Yep. First of all, we don't have the accessibility. So, you know, it, just because 100 million Chinese are traveling overseas doesn't mean that we should try and market Sarawak to those Chinese. Uh, and I think this is something, this is an opportunity for destinations like Sarawak that have unique products, unique opportunities, unique, um, you know, offerings to get more focused on value and delivering value to those markets. We can make a lot more money out of smaller niche markets than yep. trying to be a one size fits all mass tourism destination for every one of those hundred million Chinese, every one of those hundred million Europeans that are traveling, you know, we're not going to get those. We're not going to, and when they come, they're going to be disillusioned with the product because mm -hmm. it's not it's under promising on uh it's over promising and under delivering on what it offers and it's going to create a negative narrative and that negative narrative is going to grow like a snowball rolling down a hill and uh you know before we know it everyone's going to be talking negatively about sarawak mm -hmm. and we cannot underestimate the power of social media in the success yeah. or failure of the destination so i think that's a really good point to, to discuss in terms of um, in terms of what's happening um, in tourism th at the moment, there, there are a couple of ways. There are a couple of responses. Some of the, what I see with a lot of the states in Malaysia is that they are um, they're basically waiting. They're mm -hmm. waiting to see what happens, and I'm not sure that that's a good idea because it's. You know, this is a great opportunity to recalibrate. It's a great opportunity to upskill people. It's a great opportunity to take a step back and look at what we have and then, you know, start developing a strategy to market what the destination has later on. Um, so I, think, I don't think that's a great idea. I think some of the international destinations, you've probably seen Turkey is very aggressive. Taiwan is very aggressive with their marketing. I'm not sure that that's money well spent, to be honest, because I don't think the timing is right. You know, no matter, unless you're a politician, whoops, I didn't say that, you're not going to go to Turkey. And if you come back, you're going to have to spend 14 days in isolation, theoretically. So, uh, you know, that's not going to happen. Um, so I kind of think that's a bit of a wasted, wasted uh, marketing budget. So I think that uh, I like what STV is doing. You know, they're focusing on branded content. And they are, because, you know, the early part, there's a lot of the markets that Malaysia is targeting, say, for instance, the, the, the traditional small but lucrative European markets like Germany, Switzerland, UK, you know, those those guys are all researching destinations in Asia, mm. but they're not making decisions on when to travel for obvious reasons. Some destinations are talking about corridors. I think that's a mm. really good, that's a really important thing that Malaysia needs to do and Sarawak especially can offer that because Sarawak is a big place with not many people. So it has the advantage of selling something that is relatively safe. Uh, and, you know, we're already hearing about a corridor between Langkawi and Perth, which, uh, which is great. But I think we can also, we used to have that direct flight from Langkawi to Kuching, uh, sorry, from Perth to, to Kuching. I think that's something that could be revisited, but for, you know, niche segments in, 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 in uh, Perth and Western Australia. Uh, other corridors can be set, established, perhaps between Singapore, um, and obviously, you know, you've kind of got that, the Miri Brunei opportunity, which has always been there and always will be there. Um, and, I, you know, we need to start talking to these guys with content that, that, that is relevant to them. Um, we, we've always focused on the mass media approach. and. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget when we worked on that tourism project during the financial crisis, 
or before the financial crisis, and we went to Germany and walked into our hotel room, turned on CNN, and there was an ad for tourism, you know, Malaysia, truly Asia. But, you know, people in Germany don't watch CNN. You know, they're watching German language television, just like here, most, people, most of us are watching Malaysian, you know, television. And it was a global buy that looked good on paper because it gave us a lot of slot, but the reality was, you know, outside of, you know, business travelers, they're not, the local populations are not watching CNN. So I think we need to move away from that, that mass media approach. This is a great opportunity for the industry as a whole. And this applies to brands across all sectors, not just tourism. It's to move away from this mass media approach, this belief that because it's on a billboard, because it's on the six o'clock news or the eight o'clock or 10 o'clock news and, every, and three million people are seeing it, it, it's going to be value for money. It's not. And, mm. and, and this is a great opportunity for us to, to recalibrate that. Mm. Thanks, Marcus. Yeah. Um, and also right now with the saturation of advertising, of marketing, people are getting bombarded on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on Instagram, on Twitter, everywhere. So you, you sort of get jaded. So you don't actually see when people are advertising. You choose what you want to absorb. Um, so like you said, it must be more targeted. It must be a bit more personalized. I think that's the key word right now. And um, because people are already so used to it, the young, they grew up with everything, you know, all the advertising around them. So they don't pay attention anymore unless it's really um, specific to Mona, for example. They'll be like, oh, that's for me. So I do agree with that. We need to move away from mass media. Um, and that's probably the new way of um, doing branding, destination branding. And I think it applies to any other industry as well, not just tourism. Um, well, perhaps um, most other industries. Um, Gracie, yeah. what do you think about, sorry, Marcus, you wanted to add on. Just, just if I could just jump in there, the last, my last point is that if you look at the customer journey as they research a destination, they're going online, they're looking at, uh, they're looking for a content related to a destination. Now, the idea is what STB is doing is they're driving traffic to their blog. Right? They're creating a lot of content which drives traffic to the blog, and that's really good. But the problem is, at the moment, it's a straight line campaign. Okay, And what you want with branding is branding is a loop. Mm -hmm. So the technology allows us, when they go to the, to the blog, is that we should give them the opportunity to sign up for a newsletter. Mm. So whenever, you know, we then start building the relationship with them, we then start getting the data, but that newsletter has to be personalized. Mm. They don't want a newsletter every day about everything about Tower. They want things related to what they're interested in. If, if they don't sign up for the newsletter, what technology allows us to do through retargeting is that we can still follow them around by reminding them about the destination relatively inexpensively. And how this is more beneficial is that it's not just a banner campaign that goes out across all social media, which has a very minimal impact. It's actually relevant to what they're looking. We've all, we've all been followed around by Lazada, right? When we yep. make the purchase and then they try to sell us the same thing for six months. Yep. It's not relevant to, to Lazada when you might buy a mouse or a keyboard or something, but it is, perfect for a destination because the, the gestation period, you know, mm. uh, for, for making that decision could be six months. So it makes sense to follow those people around for six months. And because it's that emotional connection that you have mm. with the destination and, and Sarawak and Malaysia can make that connection. Uh, it's not going to have a negative, it's not going to be negative when people see the content. Mm. Thanks. Um, retargeting is something that I think a lot of people don't know about and they don't, they're not doing. Um, in fact, I actually bought a subscription for coffee because they've been following me around. I've been, you know, bombarded with, you know, coffee, coffee, coffee. So I'm like, okay, this is interesting. Once you click on it, they'll be following you around because they know you've got a bit of interest in it already. So, and it kind of worked. I ordered the coffee eventually. Um, and it's good. It's not to say that it's not good product. You know, I was interested, but I just needed that extra push um, towards the right direction. And that's what we want to do with retargeting. Uh, Gracie, what do you think about this new norm for branding and for destination marketing? Um, I have mixed views uh, on, on this, this new norm thing. 
uh, number one, uh, let's address the, the industry mindset. Mm. You know? uh, we've got to, 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 to make the industry mindset understand that you can't do the same thing you did before. Mm. Many, many industry partners, stakeholders, including, you know, like stakeholders, hospitality, hotels, they, they still think that, oh, we'll reactivate our, our buffet promotions, you know, and all that. Things are different. And until we are able to change, uh, I won't say change, we just need to move around in the brains a bit and understand that it is not the same. Mm. Business will be there. And, and I feel that in, in, in the case of branding, for many of us, uh, like I said, you know, uh, we, 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 we tend to, to lose it, you know, branding, marketing, sales, uh, advertising, you know, it's all lumped into one. We tend to, and, and where's the budget to do branding? Oh, it's, it's in the sales part, you know? So you, you, you see some kind of, uh, uh, I won't say confusion, just, just ignorance on, on a lot of this. So the new branding uh, for, for, Okay, I can't can't speak for other states, but for Sarawak, uh, is that uh, I I agree uh, with Marcus saying STB is is sort of uh, you know doing doing some things like they're focusing on the product strengths, you know, and we have the C A N F F, you know, culture, adventure, nature, food festivals, which basically appeals to the five senses, and this is something that's human. You know, uh, technology can harness these five senses and, and drive drive all those, you know, senses, the interest into C-A-N-F-F, which is, which uh, uh, C-A-N originally was Culture Adventure Nature. They've added in, I uh, can't remember exactly whether it's one or two years already, C-A-N Food and Festival. That's what we're good for. We have lesser people. We have more jungle. We have probably the most number of waterfalls that you know some of us haven't been there but i'm seeing that now through visits from uh, friends my friends my associates you know they post beautiful six layer waterfalls that i said where is this oh it's quite near to where where we are you know and and these are the things we have so if we if, if we look towards targeted towards our strengths of uh, what we have and harnessing our senses, I think we 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 we're as good, you know, as good as go in in, in that sense. So that when we're ready, or when the international market comes in, uh, bearing in mind, I I just want to touch briefly. Yesterday, I attended a, a, a onboarding session, and the state's coming up with a tourism master plan for the next fifteen years. Very timely. Uh, uh, you know, uh, and, and probably this has spurred us to, to start rethinking. So it's rethinking, reimagining what our strategy should be. So this is the right time to consider and to start thinking about rebranding exercise. It, it's actually less expensive. If you want to think that way, you know, there's, there's in my opinion, you know, a, a giant billboard on a, on a street junction is great, but it does not may not serve the purpose because the, the younger guys may not be looking up, they're looking into their palms, into their phones or onto their iPads or whatever. So we start looking at small and sweet and I think we'll, 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 we'll reach there. And the, the tourism master plan, uh, uh, if I'm allowed to quickly share it, uh, I think just, just about all of us know, is focusing on the CANFF and key pillars are, you will like this, it's ecotourism mm. and business events. Mm. It's not about mass tourism, it's not about big numbers and, and based on these two strong pillars, aspirations, the state calls it, on, on that they, the, the, the subsets will include sustainable tourism, environmentally friendly, impactful uh, uh, tourism, promoting our, our local community, community or community-based tourism activities. 
and and this will appeal to to our very conscious travelers now young and old they're, they're very conscious about where their money is going to pay to what and they're very happy to know that if they they're buying into a, a community-based program mm -hmm. that it actually is going to educate a child or it's going to build a, a, a you know a additional school or something so i think responsible tourism is something that's going to happen now mm -hmm. uh, uh people now understand the the negative or the impact that a virus like this can happen you know and that it could still happen you know so now we're being more careful we're being more conscious we're being more reliable uh, if i can say we're being more you know very responsible towards what we're doing and this is going to go on and there will be some some uh, okay we 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 have some people who are a little stubborn they say why are we so strict why are you wanting imposing on this and that and why are, why are you you know insisting that i share my personal information and my phone numbers and all that we have to and and if they don't if i don't get it from you somebody on the internet will get it anyway with with artificial intelligence just about everything is possible so i think the new norm is going to be good it will be different as long as our mindset will prepare for it and put some space in there that will discard the old uh big bus coach tours of you know and group tours of 200 people attacking a national park at one time that's not going to happen anymore and we shouldn't let it happen everything is controlled and you will enjoy the space given to you as mm. a traveler that you don't no more jostling around because i think yeah. we had to no more jostling on the buffet tables you know things like that is going to go and i think that's good that's from me and <laughs> Thanks, Gracie. Yeah, I think there's um, quite a few points you raised there. Responsible tourism, I think that's something that the younger generation is now very keen on. Um, and they're very conscious about um, community-based or eco-based uh, products um, and, and tourism that applies to tourism. Marcus, you mentioned about branding is a loop. So it's, it's more like a, a boomerang that you throw, it must come back to you. So it's not a frisbee you throw and you just let go and you know nothing happens after that. Um, and I think that's the, our weakness um, in branding. Um, we post things out on social media, we send out um, emails, you know, we send out um, even newsletters, but nothing comes back. There's no call to action, there's no personalization, it's just, you know, flushing things out. And it's like, you know, uh, verbal diarrhea or words diarrhea, you want to call it, you know, you, you think that doing as much postings or putting things out um, as much as you can, that's good branding, but it's not because you're not getting anything back. Um, so um, if you want to bring it back into industry players, people in the tourism industry, um, travel operators, hotels, um, bus drivers, or even uh, suppliers, um, would there be any practical steps that they could take um, to improve their branding practices right now uh, for recovery? Um, how would you tell them uh, to improve their branding at the current moment? might want to unmute yourself yeah uh i think that um i think there's a couple of things right first of all is that the pandemic is going to end but mm -hmm. it's not going to be an on off light switch kind of moment it's going to be something that is gradual and i think a lot of the stakeholders um also need to perhaps uh reduce their reliance on the government mm. to manage the way out of the this crisis uh for whatever reason the government tends to drive the tourism industry where the players kind of hang on to the coattails and i think that needs to change and i think this is an opportunity for them to change that to start living on their own i think that while the pandemic is going on if they haven't done this already they, they should be uh, basically reviewing operations, especially marketing, their approach. We've talked about how mass media doesn't work. It's prohibitively expensive. It's impossible to measure. And if you, you, know, you spend hundreds of millions of dollars or ringgit or pounds up until the, the financial crisis or the pandemic or SARS or whatever, you know, if that money is completely wasted, you have to start again afterwards. So it's, 
there has to be a move away from that social media, which we discussed. I think it's also an opportunity to reskill reskill teams. Um, you know, organisations have kind of you know, it's always oh we'll, we'll upskill people tomorrow, we'll reskill people tomorrow. Let's we're making money, everything's fine, the business is coming in. Now that that happens, now that stopped, here's a great opportunity to reskill, to upskill teams with a focus on the experience. Mm. Sarawak really is a unique destination. So is Trungana. So is Kalantan and uh, uh, Perlis and Kuda and so on, you know. But you don't really experience that as a visitor to these loca to these destinations because they, it's not clearly defined. So, you know, there's a lot of discussion goes on with, with uh, stakeholders, but uh, I don't think there's enough implementation. So I think that, you know, everyone's good for it. Sarawak is putting together this, the master plan, which is fantastic. It's, it's great news to have that, but we really need a great implementation team. If that's just another plan that sits on a shelf gathering dust, it's gonna be wasted. Um, so, and I think that uh, tourism players also need to have a recovery plan. Mm. Uh, if they don't have a plan, everything is guesswork, they're reacting. Planning allows you to, you know, well, plan to every, and, and if you're not planning, it's you're guessing. And every plan mm. will have a crisis plan within that plan. Mm. And if you have a crisis plan, you will hopefully have been a little bit better prepared for this pandemic or God forbid the next one that comes along. Um, and I think, you know, hotels, I, I hope you talked about buffets and jostling for the buffets. I hope we've seen the end of buffets uh, from this pandemic. That could be something good that comes out of this Yeah. Uh, for a number of reasons. Um, what, but joking aside, what else? Data. Mm -hmm. You know, the other thing is data, you know, Data is so important and it's so easy to collect that data now. We don't mind sharing information with destinations. We don't mind sharing information with, you know, platforms, shopping platforms. So let's take advantage of that by building relationships with the customers. And, you know, personalization is key to the to future branding. And those, uh, you know, industry operators have an opportunity to build relationships and to get personal. And, and this is the time to do it. Put the infrastructure in place now. It's not expensive. The technology is out there. Um, so yeah, so that's, those are kind of three or four areas that I think they can work on. Thanks, Marcus. And um, I, I think I like the part, the implementation part of this plan or whatever plan that we're having, it's um, no, no use if you're just gonna chuck it away, put it on the shelf. Um, put it in a cupboard or anything like that. And I think that's, um, as I mentioned earlier, that's something that we may be weaker at um, implementing it and sustaining it for a long-term uh, period. Gracie, do you have any ideas on implementing a branding or sustaining it for Sarawak? <laughs> I, could, I could speak the whole day. Um, you know, we, 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 we sometimes have this tendency to re, uh, we, we come up with new products or new packages. When we actually had good products or good packages, it was just the execution part, the implementation part. And, and, and I, I can see from just from the brief outline of, of what's, you know, being planned, the, the tourism master plan is great. My concern uh, is the implementation and the agencies, because I'll, let's be, be, be honest, if you're a government, you're the policy, you're the driver, you, you, you make it happen, you spend the money for, for, for the industry, but they can't be there to be, to be running it, implementing it, and making sure that it's run according to plan. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, I, I feel, I agree, uh, we're a little weak in that area. We, 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 we do a song and dance about the best plan that we, and we actually do. At the end of the day, question is, who makes it happen? Who's going to work this plan and who's going to make it happen? So it's got to be maybe people like you and me and all of us out here 
you know, to make sure the, the, the brand branding exercise is correct or if there is one, you know, and that uh, uh, whatever we plan to do, because sometimes people come in and out. It's like, a, a, you know, people go in, they listen, oh, there's nothing in there for me, I'm out. Because it's normal, you know, uh, people who want to come in and say they, they want to see some instant gratification or benefit. So that's going to be a problem. So so industry people here are sitting together, huddling right now even, you know, talking about what's the best thing, what's the strategic plan, what's the action. This plan is going to happen and it's going to be great. I, I, I am concerned, uh, although I understand that there are agencies, there are agencies, but are these agencies enough or you know and are these agencies filled with the industry specialists or the experts or the stakeholders you know like if i own a, if i own a 50 million dollar hotel i want to make sure that you know things are done cor correctly so that my rooms get filled up you know if a big hoo-ha on a package and, and no one's benefiting from it you know just just as as a, a wild idea so i think the implementation process mm. must include stakeholders must include the industry specialists the people you know not of one uh, association or not of one company yeah it has to be a grouping of all these people into this implementation unit if you want to call it and then we probably will 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 likely to see things moving. Of course, like you said, you know, uh, in in a plan, it's not a hundred percent. If we can work on it, and every year have twenty percent happen successful, Pareto, you know, and and move on and move on, and then like you say, a, a monitoring and control uh, uh, unit as well, an agency again, you know, another agency to make sure it's done accordingly. And if it's not working, you have the first quarter, second quarter to, to get things right. And then you will then see, ah, the plan works. It will not work for everybody in the first quarter. It worked for this unit, maybe certain stakeholders. It may work for the tour operators. It may work for the homestay. It's, it's really a huge synergy of energies that we need to bring together to make this happen. I have to stop now because I'll, I'll just end up <laughs> talking the whole day. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, we have one question um, from an anonymous uh, person who's saying that do you think that industry players will actually go back the, to, to the conventional ways of doing things? Or, I mean, we're, we're talking about the new norm, you know, ecotourism, no more mass tourism, no more buffets and stuff like that. Um, and also branding, um, you know, more personalized, more targeted branding or marketing. Um, but are they going to go back to what they've been used to um, or what they're used to when things are more comfortable again? So they get more complacent and they'll be back to their usual self. Um, or will they adopt this new way of doing things and buck up? Uh, what do you guys think? Can I answer that first? Yep. I'll, I'll, I think uh, uh, many, many of us in the business will have to change mm -hmm. our ways of doing business. And, you know, now, now, you know, the number of Zoom meetings we have, you know, is already an indication. And, and now another, another strategy is to have a Zoom meet with, with your client in, in Germany, for example. Hey, you know, you just made this booking, you're coming to Sarawak. What, you know, this is what I can, hey, and then I can show you some pictures. It becomes very personalized. It's, it's, it's different. So I, I think we can't just resort to an email, a booking form. And online, online is great. Believe me, it's great. But the personalization has to be. Remember, small is sweet. We're going for every every unit of business we're getting. It's no more, you know, one one shot, and then we we hit we hit a, a busload of people. It's very different. But the yield factor can improve. You know, I mean, I mean, it, it's how we look at again back to what we have. C A N F F. The hundreds of products within just the five. Uh, uh, thrust pillars, you know, uh, uh, of, of what the state has. So I think uh, we should not go back. We should not ask if will they go back. Don't go back to your old norm. You may have to, you know, you, 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 you know, you, you may have to adjust. And I think adjustments will actually save you money and a lot of time. 
you, you don't need to buy that bus you were planning for that coach that 40 seater it's sorry it you don't need that because they are they are when you need it there are suppliers for it so a lot of a lot of again mindset it's about how you think your business you know you got a you got a huge uh you know inventory of vans vehicles and all that you know where is it now it's sitting somewhere so now we you 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 can't say when i get back i'm going to reuse you know yeah you probably can reuse if you you put innovation into place you reuse it to become a courier service you know yeah, things like that it becomes different and if you do some projections on the tourism product the subsidiary services or you can call supplementary services in a tour program uh i i think in one one webinar i i, I attended we are talking about virtual tours. Sounds great, right? Are the tour operators and the industry partners ready for it? Do they know how to do it? Are there people catering for these services? Yes, probably. But you know, there's still that mismatch. It's not meeting. So I think I think tour operators, industry, hotels, included hospitality, need to say that. Pick up. I mean, it's not going to be a complete 360 change of totally new things. No, but some things have to be left behind. You've got to adopt. Yeah. Um, thanks. Uh, we've got one comment, very interesting comment from Dayang Mariani Abang Zain. Um, if the government is serious, they have um, to work together in this and not just prepare a master plan on paper. And I think that's what we've been talking about, the implementation part of it, not just on paper, but we need to have a team executing it. Um, you mentioned products and um, uh, what industry players, we, we market the products that we have in Sarawak, um, the national parks so or any events that we can sell, um, we package it together, um, we bring the guests to these uh, products that we have in Sarawak. But the products are managed by, um, not us, by other people who may not, be managing it well enough and when you market it people go there hey it doesn't look like the picture that you put you posted on facebook what is this i want my money back um so how do you how do you deal with that you know when it's beyond your control marcus i see you nodding there do you have anything to say about that yeah i'm eager, eager to jump on, in on that one but i can see yep. great is grimacing in case i say something uh, controversial <laughs> But I just want to, before I answer that, it's a good question. Before I answer that, I just want to say that, you know, we have to change. Yep. Malaysia as a destination, it's broken, right? The fact of the matter is it's broken. Visitor arrivals to uh, Malaysia have been flatlining for 10 years. Meanwhile, in Thailand, they've been going up, you know, mm. 10, 20, 30% over the same period. Indonesia is about to take off. Indonesia is going to be, um, you know, the, the, the next big destination in Southeast Asia. So uh, we've got a big challenge coming from there. Um, there's also uh, the issue with zero dollar tours, um, especially from China. Those, uh, those tours are causing a lot of problems in that they're not distributing the wealth enough. I did, I heard, I don't know if it's true, that only six companies represent all of the inbound tourists from China, which is, you know, needs to be addressed fairly quickly. Another thing is we talk about the product and maybe what we should be talking about is experiences. But when we talk about the product, Malaysia, everybody loves Malaysia. Every international tourist loves Malaysia, but there's nothing to bring them back the second time. Mm -hmm. You can do everything in Malaysia worth doing at the moment in a week. There have been more, uh, there's been more resorts developed in Hua Hin in the last 10 years than have been developed in Malaysia ever. You know, it's, it's incredible how Hua Hin as a simple destination within Thailand, which is a pain to get to, you've got to fly into Bangkok, you've got to drive for an hour and a half or whatever to get there. But they have created a great niche by taking what they have and marketing it very successfully to the right target market. So we have to, there has to be, from a government level, there has to be uh, a change in policy making towards investing in the, uh, in the tourism industry. Because if you're a property developer and you develop a, an apartment block, you essentially get your money back before you even start laying the first brick. If 
you want to build a five-star hotel or a six-star you know, resort in the middle of the jungle uh, as a well-being destination, it could take you 15 years to get your money back. Mm. Where's the incentive at the moment for that investment to be made? It's simply not there. Um, so that's, you know, that's something that we really look, we need to look at. The industry as it is, is broken. We can't afford to go back to the old ways. We just literally can't because we're going to get left behind as a destination. Uh, in terms of the, the implementation, it has to, you know, this has to happen. I mean, it really is important that we, um, you know, I need to open that question again. What was the question again? Is the government in Syria have to work together in this, not just the mark? And she's absolutely right. You know, we have to uh, have, and Gracie's already outlined it, we have to have an Im implementation action team to implement any uh, national branding tourism plan. Thanks, Marcus. Um, Gracie, what do you think about our tourism products and how they are managed um, to deliver, you know, fantastic experiences or um, how are you looking at that at the moment? Yeah, uh, like I said, we, we, we have our tourism products in place. Uh, some may not be managed for tourism. Mm. In, you know, like, like I'd like to state that, you know, close to, if, if not more, uh, 60 to 70 percent of our tourism products are very much culture adventure nature. And most of our, our sort of highlights, tourism products are in national parks, protected areas, which is great. So you, you need to adhere to, to rules and regulations, you know, which is good. And we need to, but national parks are not managed by tourism. They, they, they are into conservation, they're into park management, they're into the well-being of the wildlife. The, 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 so there, there is that little grey area. And, and I think that's coming around, Marcus, because I, I'm, I'm just as I'm talking and, and you know, I think it's coming around that they, there is this understanding that tourism is a big thing for, 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 mm. for Sarawak. You know, it's, it's one of our biggest assets uh, uh, in terms that we are able... The, the, the trickling effect of tourism benefits the communities, uh, benefits the, the, the sanctuaries, the, the parks, the, the, the villages, uh, uh, you know, just about, you know, other than, you know, all the, the givens, the accommodations and the, the shopping and all that. So our, our products are there. And I and, uh, just want to mention like what Dayang is mentioning is probably what all of us echo is that we have a great, we have the product. We're now putting it together on paper. So everything's great on paper. We need to have uh, the understanding like, like, you know, the implementation. I, I, I go back to it. And, and I've always also put the question to, to people who put together products. Uh, and then they say, oh, it didn't work. And my question is back to why. Were you a lousy tour operator? Was the product lousy? not nice or was it marketing mm. so i said I, I i want people to think marketing because sometimes we forget we become very sales oriented we push up with the highest beautiful glossy whatever picture and think and then like you said mona that then when they arrive it's not what it is you know so i think they they again blur, blurry areas and the best part of all is that what we have our issues are not serious they're all rectifiable, they, are, uh, they, they can be amended, they can be tweaked, they can be re-engineered, use all the buzzwords you want, it can be done because we've got what it takes. And the, the thing is to drive, to drive that when, when everything you know, comes back to, to near normal, that it can be driven, that people will come in and appreciate what we have. We had good tourism. I mean, I mean, uh, uh, Sarawak has garnered, you know, like not, not as many as, uh, not as much as some, some other states. But, you know, uh, we, we, I think in 2019, it was like 12 billion in tourism receipts. And that's accounted for. And we have the non-accounted for again. And the trickling down effect could, could, could also be more. So we, we have what it takes. And we're not, we haven't even, uh, how do you call, put our tourism engine into full throttle yet. And I think with this COVID and post-COVID, it kick-started to get a lot of things going. 
The tourism board is, is very, very active. The, the Ministry of Tourism is doing, and I'm, I'm happy, you know, to be able to be a little part, if I can, and all of us are in there, that we can make it happen. So I I really echo with what Diane is saying because we, we, we've been in the industry long enough. We've seen tourism plans. We've seen blueprints. We've seen a lot of master plans. We just want to make sure we're not, you know, we're not shouting and screaming and angry about it. We just want to make it happen so that I don't have to attend so many labs and workshops to find out what's wrong, you know. So I think we're on the right track. I hope I don't get shot for that. <laughs> Thanks, Gracie. I, I don't think you will. Um, and we have one question from an anonymous attendee. I think I know who's asking this question. Um, looking at China and Singapore, where COVID cases are under control, um, local tourism is rapidly on the rise. Malaysia should be ready for this uh, surge when it happens. Uh, countries which come out of this pandemic first will benefit most, but are we ready? Yep. So that's the question. Are we ready for that surge um, when we come out of the pandemic? We are coming out slowly, but are we actually ready for this um, domestic tourism, as you, you're calling it, local tourism? What do you think, Marcus? Well, I'm not sure it's going to be a surge. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be very gradual, <clears throat> uh, even from Singapore, Brunei, local market. Uh, I think... Uh, uh, is the country ready for that, the, the, the post-COVID environment? I think that Malaysia has done a brilliant job of, um, you know, suppressing the COVID uh, pandemic in Malaysia. And I don't think we're banging our chest enough on that matter, to be honest, and, and sharing that information with the, with the, uh, with the, with the world. I think post COVID, as we open the, these corridors, we're starting to see something, you know, movement between Singapore and Malaysia, certainly West Malaysia. Um, I think that the main thing that we have to do as an industry, in a tourism industry, is be transparent, be mm. open, and provide accessible information. I think on the tourism website, they should have the numbers, the COVID numbers in the state, have a map outlining the safe zone, have safe, uh, you know, hotlines to call if you have an issue, uh, have a special COVID Twitter account, Instagram account, be completely accessible, make people feel comfortable and safe that they go there. And what we're seeing in Europe with the, with the horrendous handling of the pandemic by the UK government, where they're shutting down, you know, they're saying, right, you can't come back from Greece, if you come back from Greece or, or Turkey or wherever it is in the next within uh, later than 48 hours, you've got to isolate for 14 days. You can't do that. That's just going to decimate the industry further. We have to be, uh, you know, leverage on the great work of the Ministry of Health and maintain that that approachable, um, mm. you know, uh, authentic, transparent approach that they've had and replicate that in Sarawak and be honest with people. People want honesty, they want authenticity, they want genuineness. If we're saying, okay, you can't go to Cebu because it's a red zone, okay? So change your plans, we'll help you change your plans, this is how you do it. If, if we map out the process, it will restore confidence a lot quicker. Okay. Um, and the question was actually, our service providers, are they ready for this, what you mentioned about? Um, I'll, I'll just pick on quickly. Yeah. Uh, I agree with Marcus. I, I, it's not going to be a search. And, and also, uh, 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 I, I think our industry people, our business people in the tourism industry, expect, do not expect the same level of business you had before, the good business. Surprisingly, uh, uh, speaking to another person in, in the business is saying that their business has picked up. Yeah. a lower of below to higher now wow. because they they, they 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 reprogram certain things okay i'm i'm I, I'm, I'm not allowed to to say this but you see for some people they 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 make it but for those uh who've had you know the tra traditionally let's say big guys you know or the big operators 
your occupancy is not going to be your so not going to be the same your number of visitors travelers or tourists that you're going to handle is not going to be the same the volume of revenue also will decline but when you adapt and change your mindset and and re re-engineer your whole operations it may balance off it may balance off but i i could safely say for all of us um expect uh, well this year is gone you know I, I i don't even have 2020 you know i i'm i'm I, I don't i don't have 2020 in my agenda in my year you know i'm straight on to 2021 it will be like a a, a 40 percent decline if you if you address that now and you know that you're going to have a 40 percent decline at least you start thinking of how do you level up how you do? How do you scale in or, or or cover for that shortfall by doing what? Yeah. So I'm very so pleased to hear from a friend who's saying that you know the business has actually, you know, improved. And when they were just you know like you know slumbering away and then boom, you know, just because they decided to do something, you know. So I think I think the search, um, no, it's not going to be a search. There'll be a comeback. Not all hotels are going to make it. Not all eateries and restaurants are going to make it. Not all uh, souvenir shops especially are going to make it because remember that domestic tourism uh, will also have a, a bit of the, the spending power is slightly different. People are looking for a value. They want to stretch their dollar. And, and domestic tourism is very family oriented, you know, and, and so value for money becomes the, the, the big item. On, on, on the ticket you know like if if we, we in Sarawak logistics has connectivity has always been uh, uh, you know our we, we cry and mourn about you know how many little flights and all that and and you know screaming at the airlines for not bringing in so it's the same for the traveler a domestic package can be really affordable right now the the program that we have is is heavily marketed and subsidized by by the our tourism ministry or board. But to fly in here again, then you see that mismatch. Or flights are full. So I can have a, a, a $500 package to Muru, for example, but I can't fly in there because ah, it's, it's full. Or it is prohibitive. The fare is more than the package. So we have all these issues that we need to address. And that's not, you know, that's something I think every other destination will have. But as long as we address that, we are aware of it and the parties involved can sit down and say, hey, we got to work at this for this recovery period until we get back on our two feet again. So no search, unfortunately, uh, uh, to, to that question. <laughs> Thanks, Gracie. Yeah, I do agree with both of you. I don't think there's going to be a sudden surge. I, I think it's going to be a gradual, you know, trickling in of domestic tourists and um, early demand or revenge tourism, as Marcus uh, mentioned. And um, we're going to wrap up right now. We've gone beyond one hour and I don't want to bore um, our attendees too much. Uh, and um, I know we could go on and there's a lot more that we could talk about, but um, I think um, one of the key points that I got was um, branding is a loop. Um, and whatever you do in branding, it must come back. Uh, so we can't just keep flushing things out and not pull it back in. So there must be strings attached, I think. And, um, and um, the, the branding that we do for destination or tourism or any other products right now, it has changed. The, the market has changed. So we need to study what the new customers are looking for. In tourism right now, it's uh, ecotourism. They're a bit more conscious about their spending. They're conscious about where they go, whether they're destroying um, the community there, um, the ecosystem there. Are they doing anything good for the community? Uh, so we need to look at that when we're doing branding, um, and this is for tourism, but that applies to other industries as well. You need to look at your products, what your customers want. Um, and um, Gracie mentioned like, um, you know, um, we take things for granted, like uh, um, eating in, in, in bamboo, you know, manok panso, and people are like, ah, oh, that's boring, you know, I, I, I see that every day. But to foreigners, that's something like, wow, 
So we need to look at it from the point of uh, from the point of view of your clients, not from your point of view. So you need to do a bit of market research. So something that appeals to you might not appeal to them, um, and vice versa. So um, that's basically it. If you have any other questions, please channel them to our Facebook page or you can email directly to us, info at placeborneo.com. And um, we'll be back in another two weeks uh, for the next Tuesday Talk Live. I'm not sure what the topic will be, but we'll be updating you on that one. Uh, thank you very much to Marcus and Gracie for joining us and for the very, very insightful information that you guys have um, today with us. And um, thank you to the attendees on Zoom and also on YouTube and to the questions that you guys have asked. Uh, I think we've got actually a few more questions, but we don't have time to address all of them. Uh, oh. <laughs> yep. So um, thank you very much, everyone. And um, have a good day ahead. See you guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 B